here and be a part of contributing to the discussion in this way. Um, so I just want to say thank you all for joining. As uh, as Dr. Cope said, we will do our best to analyze the case and hopefully make explicit and external many of the often implicit and internal cognitive processes that go through solving a case. Uh, I can promise to you all that I will be as authentic as I can in terms of uh, sharing how I would think through this case in, in an authentic clinical practice setting, and hopefully be able to organize um, uh, a structured approach to these different problems, first off, starting with jaundice. And so I think, as as you said, Dr. Cope, jaundice is a very rich chief concern to enter in with because, um, one, it has a very rich and broad differential diagnosis, but also affords a very structured and systematic approach to understanding this problem, right? Um, the clinical finding of jaundice translates to the laboratory finding of hyperbilirubinemia. And we can then ask ourselves, well, what are some mechanisms? mechanisms by which individuals can develop hyperbilirubinemia. And I think the first branch point in, in jaundice really comes from what is the source of that of that excess uh, of those excess bilirubin levels in the bloodstream? Is it because the hepatobiliary system is having a difficult time processing, conjugating, and excreting hyperbilirubinemia? Or is there something happening in the peripheral circulation that is leading to an, an excess production of unconjugated bilirubin in the bloodstream? The latter, an excess production of unconjugated bilirubin in the bloodstream can come from something, for example, like hemolysis, whereas the former, right, hepatobiliary disease is associated with, um, with hyperbilirubinemia, we can think through as really intrahepatic cholestasis or extrahepatic cholestasis. In other words, there is a problem intrinsic to the liver itself that's leading to difficulties processing it, or there may be something within the um, biliary ductal system uh, that's leading to, for example, biliary ductal obstruction, and as a result, a backup of bilirubin into the bloodstream. If we think about then at this point in the case, right, um, the laboratory evidence will help us, but we can also use an analysis of these initial factors to understand what some clues to the cause of this person's jaundice may be. Um, I think there's a couple different variables that we can start to attend to as we think about um, uh, how we can understand whether this is a direct hyperbilirubinemia, which is most likely from the hepatobiliary system, or an indirect process, which could be something happening in the bloodstream. And I think the three variables that I tend to look at is, first off, um, uh, how jaundice is this person? Because the degree of jaundice plays a factor. Um, if somebody has really, really intense, deep jaundice and very, very high bilirubin levels, the likelihood that this is a direct hyperbilirubinemia goes up dramatically, right? It is pretty hard to generate, I would say, I won't say impossible, but very difficult to generate exceedingly high bilirubin levels from just, for example, hemolysis alone. But when we see deep, deep jaundice, the likelihood of double digit bilirubin levels starts to go up, and that may turn our attention to the abdomen as a potential etiology of it. The other thing is we'll start to attune to the presence or absence of any sort of gastrointestinal symptoms. Has this person been experiencing early satiety? Have they been experiencing weight loss, right upper quadrant pain, or other intra-abdominal system or symptoms? Because again, that may attend or may tune our attention to thinking about the hepatobiliary system. And then a couple other things that we may look for is, are there symptoms outside of the abdominal space? Are we seeing things that may suggest an underlying anemia, like shortness of breath or pallor? Because that may turn our attention actually to thinking about the possibility of an indirect hyperbilirubinemia. If we go through this person's past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, AFib, and type 2 diabetes, I can't say that any of those things are drastically shifting the probabilities for me in either direction. And same thing for the medications. When I was scanning through the medication list, one of the things that I was looking for was any meds that may induce um, a hemolytic anemia, certain drug associated or certain medications associated with drug induced hemolysis or sulfa medications, which which um, which may lead to the development of something like G6PD deficiency. In the absence of those, I have a hard time making a ton of progress from the medication list. Um, certainly, if if we were to think about um, uh, uh, extra hepatic causes of jaundice, we would worry about intra abdominal cancer and specifically pancreatic malignancy. We don't necessarily see key risk factors here in terms of tobacco 
tobacco or alcohol use, but the base rate of something like a pancreatic neoplasm is high enough in the general population that we would be thinking about that in any late middle age to older individual who's presenting with jaundice. I think that sort of is the general framework that I would be looking for using that key branch point up front and then starting to look for some clues to say, okay, we're being moved towards the hepatobiliary system or we're being moved towards the bloodstream, acknowledging that the base rate is going to favor the hepatobiliary system. Incredible. And I, I just love how you already upfront with very little information are presenting an approach that doesn't get too into the nitty gritty, but allows you to at least start thinking about the types of questions you'd want to be asking. In fact, you already outlined a number of questions you'd want to be asking, including, including abdominal symptoms um, and whether they have shortness of breath and other extra abdominal symptoms. And you also are mentioning things that you'd want to be looking for on the exam already. So you're sort of priming your brain for when this additional information comes. And I think that's something that is really great for us to do as clinicians is to start to prime our brains even before we see our patients. You know, often we'll have a little bit of data before the ER, but it's so nice starting to think about like, what is my differential, even as I'm on the way down in the elevator. Amazing. So let's get you a little more information so you can say a little bit more. And you already perfectly outlined your approach here. So, um, wanted to give you sort of the, the condensed HPI for this patient, um, and then really the emergency room data. I'll be presenting both those things. So the pertinent positives is that he has very mild epigastric abdominal pain. He really rated it on a maybe one to two out of 10, um, not really fluctuating, but really not causing him much in the way of symptoms. Um, the only recent change in his meds was the addition of linagliptin uh, about a month ago um, for his diabetes. His stools are lighter in color than usual, he notes, um, but not profoundly, not like totally clay colored. Um, his urine is dark. Um, there's quite a few pertinent negatives in this case. His appetite is actually totally intact. No nausea, no vomiting. Um, no significant weight loss, no fevers or chills, no rashes, no new herbal supplements or other over-the-counter meds, and no recent viral illnesses. There's obviously stuff that I've left missed here or maybe not included. Um, I will say that a review of systems for other things like shortness of breath and whatnot, as you had mentioned, was, was really negative. Um, so let's get you an examination. Um, he is grossly jaundiced, so very significantly jaundiced. Um, and I'm just going to highlight the, the pertinent points here and not necessarily the negative ones. Um, he, of course, has scleral ectoris as well. His abdomen's soft. It's non-tender. His normal bowel sounds. No masses are felt. He doesn't have any spider angiomatas no caput, uh, caput medusa, no fluid wave, no shifting dullness. Um, he has no clubbing, no cyanosis or edema, and no asterixis. His, his um, vitals are, as noted over on, on the left, um, he's afebrile, heart rate in the 70s, breathing comfortably um, at 14, blood pressure is 130s over 80s, and he's satting well in room air. Um, I actually have, I have more data for you in this aliqua, but um, just so we don't have to go back and forth, maybe I will get your reflections um, on this examination um, and any of this pertinent um, clinical information here. Absolutely. Yeah. D um, Dr. Kobe, if we could, could go back one slide to the recent, this is perfect here. So I think um, uh, as, as you were saying, Dr. Kobe, the utility of a framework up front is that it can give us um, really a map or almost um, uh, a set of navigational tools to explore and understand a clinical problem. And if we use that map that we just recently talked about and say, okay, now that we're encountering um, uh, some new data on this journey through this 68-year-old gentleman with jaundice, how does that map inform where we take our diagnostic journey? And if we look at the per positives here. I think there's uh, two that are jumping out at me that can maybe help us think about where we want to explore this map next. The first is um, the presence of very mild epigastric ab abdominal pain. I think that um, only very mild pain may be something that's easy to dismiss in somebody who's coming in with jaundice, but I will say the presence of, of any abdominal symptoms does play a role for me. Um, particularly because many of the causes, or I shouldn't say many, but some of the causes of jaundice, particularly those related to extrahepatic biliary obstruction, can be indolent and slow-growing disease processes. For example, slowly progressive masses within the abdominal compartment. Um, and um, the degree of symptoms that an individual experiences is in some ways related to the severity of the pathology, right? So the size of the, of 
the, uh, the size of the mass that grows there or um, how much of an obstruction is there, but also the tempo of disease. And so a very acute process is likely to present with acute high amplitude sim symptoms, whereas a slower, more indolent process may, per may present with slower, more indolent symptoms. So while the mild epigastric pain, um, uh, I may be holding with some degree of uh, not necessarily un, un, uncertainty, but um, I think giving it a softer weight here, uh, it still does play a role at all because again, it does start to turn our attention to the, to the intra-abdominal space. And then the other interesting feature is the fact that the stools are slightly lighter in color than usual. Um, many individuals may know that um, part of the reason that our stools take on a, a, a darker color is actually because of the bilirubin that gets extruded into the gastrointestinal tract. And so um, paler colored stools can be a signal for the presence of biliary ductal obstruction. In other words, there's not bile that's making its way from the gallbladder and the ductal system through the common bile duct, through the pancreatic duct, and ultimately into the duodenum. And so that may also give us some more signal that perhaps there is um, uh, uh, difficulties with the, with the excretion of bile, which oftentimes relates to um, dysfunction somewhere within the biliary tree. So again, I think we're mounting evidence that sort of is, again, continuing to tune our attention towards the hepatobiliary system. And then I think if we move on to the exam, um, we see more information supporting that, right? The fact that this individual is grossly jaundiced, at least for me, increases the probability of this being relatively high bilirubin levels, potentially into the double digits or, um, uh, uh, or into the 20s, which again, as we were saying from the beginning, deep, deep jaundice uh, tends to suggest a hepatobiliary cause. Um, and the other thing that we see here, which helps us better understand the potential pathology that may be happening in the hepatobiliary system, is really the absence of findings suggestive of portal hypertension. Right? So if we think about um, separating these two things, um, jaundice can develop from the hepatobiliary system, either being the liver being dysfunctional in its ability to process bilirubin or in its ability to excrete bilirubin. Um, cirrhosis or um, uh, uh, hepatic fibrosis is one of the causes of intrahepatic diseases that lead to high bilirubin levels. And that tends to come along with other findings suggestive of portal hypertension, things like ascites, kaput, medusa, um, uh, uh, and for example, on labs, thrombocytopenia. We don't see any of those features here. And so I think the lack of portal, uh, the lack of um, uh, clear portal hypertension um, at least um, makes the possibility of hepatic fibrosis as a cause of jaundice less likely. But certainly there's many other diseases within the hepatobiliary system that can lead to um, that can lead to hyperbilirubinemia, but not necessarily cause portal hypertension. So I think it's helpful to frame here, right? A very common cause of jaundice is individuals who have cirrhosis, and we may not see some of the key hallmark features on exam here for that. And that's further supported by the absence of asterixis, right? The liver is able to do part of its recycling function in terms of processing some of the various toxins that can build up during hepatic dysfunction. Um, but I still think uh, I still think intrahepatic or extrahepatic cholestasis is potentially at play, and I'm not taking off an indirect hyperbilirubinemia uh, off the list here um, uh, until we get further clarity. But I think that's is, is how this information and the exam is helping to at least advance my thinking through the case at this point. Standing, I, I love it how you're still using you know your framework of how to of of jaundice, um, including indirect, direct things like this, and you're starting to basically give us your, your um, uh, you know, how you're prioritizing them uh, without even having the labs back yet, um, which is really helpful. I also find because if a lab comes back consistent with what you're thinking, it's really easy to continue down that train and, you know, you add pretest probability and, and, and you can get to a diagnosis e easier. If something comes back totally discordant. It's a real, a, a, a great thing to stick on and be like, wow, something's, something's not fitting. Something's really different. Um, and can make you sort of double down on that area. Great, well, let's get you some information and see if what you were saying uh, really does line up or not. So here's the patient's labs. I'm really presenting all of the emergency room labs at once. Um, and I will just highlight um, some of the more important labs for you to take a look at. Um, specifically, um, the patient's LFTs were the most abnormal. You can see an AST of 396, an ALT of 645, alkaline phosphatase of 1,081, and a T bili of 19.1 with a direct bilirubin of 18. The albumin was 3.3 and the total protein was 6.4. A BMP was grossly pretty unremarkable. 
Um, and our CBC was fairly unremarkable with a hemoglobin of 11.6 um, and a very mildly elevated white count of 10.5 with the differential, as you can see right there beside it. Um, a lipase was obtained in the emergency room and was 342. A troponin was negative and a B Nancy peptide was 88. All right. So excellent, excellent updates now in the case so far. Um, Dr. Cope, just to clarify for me, um, in my mind, that lipase level flags as um, uh, uh, a few times above the upper limit of normal. I just want to clarify that that is indeed the same in that your is lab correct. there. Yeah, the upper limit of normal, I believe, is in the 60s. So it's definitely over okay. three times the upper limit of normal. All right, excellent. And so I think um, if we start our analysis of the labs at this point, right, we can use the labs, as Dr. Cope was saying, to really sort of test and evaluate some of the initial hypotheses that we had. As we enter the case, we said that the base rate of, of causes of jaundice would favor hepatobiliary causes. We collected some clues um, in terms of uh, elements of the history in the exam that further supported that hypothesis. And I think the labs here help to give even more weight to the hypothesis that we're dealing with either an intrahepatic cause of jaundice or an extrahepatic cause of jaundice. And the specific pieces of data that are, um, I think, supporting that analysis is the fact that we indeed have a very, very high total bilirubin level of 19, and the vast majority of that is direct. And so we can see that rather than there being an excess production of indirect bilirubin from something like hemolysis, there actually seems to be um, uh, effective conjugation of the bilirubin in the liver, but perhaps difficulties with excreting the bilirubin from the liver into the biliary tree or from the biliary tree into the duodenum. The other piece of the lab that, I, um, that is notable is the presence of the lipase elevation. If we just take the three features of, mild, of some abdominal pain, as well as an, an uh, elevated lipase that's above three times the upper limit of normal, we would say that this is actually somebody who has pancreatitis. But as Dr. Cope was saying from the beginning, this isn't the classic illness script for pancreatitis. The abdominal pain is only mild. It sounds like it has been relatively smoldering. And we can oftentimes think about pancreatitis as much more, again, of a high amplitude, relatively acute onset abdominal pathology. But if we reanalyze the lipase level through the lens of the possibility of biliary obstruction, as we were saying before, um, uh, it does invoke the question for me of, oh, is there actually also, in addition to biliary ductal obstruction, potentially pancreatic ductal obstruction? Because all of us make lipase um, all of the time to help us process and digest food. Um, if that lipase is being produced, but there's a difficulty with the lipase being excreted, we can see it start to leak out leak out into the bloodstream. And so I think if we say, okay, now we have some, some signal that we're in the intrahepatic or extrahepatic causes of jaundice, um, the next question is how do we differentiate whether it is indeed intra or extrahepatic? The most helpful test in that case is, off, is going to be imaging where we can look for first off masses that may be obstructing the biliary ductal system, stones or strictures are other things that can cause biliary ductal system obstruction. But what all of those processes coalesce onto is the finding of biliary ductal dilation on the cross-sectional abdominal imaging or on an ultrasound. And so that's gonna be the feature that we're really looking for in the next step to say, do we analyze the liver or do we analyze the biliary system as the cause of this gentleman's jaundice? But the lipase for me does maybe increase the probability of an obstructive process a little bit because that's one way that we can start to tie together um, uh, bile isn't able to be excreted into the biliary tree, and there may be some difficulties with lipase being excreted into the intestines um, because those two structures co come come together before they get dumped through the ampulla of water into the into the intestinal tract. Um, I would say that's primarily what the labs are doing for me now, and then certainly there's the, an absence of findings that are helpful. Anytime we're worried about um, uh, extrahepatic biliary obstruction and jaundice, cholangitis necessarily comes into our mindset because it can be a very, very aggressive and life-threatening illness. And so far, we haven't seen any features to suggest a systemic infectious process. There was an absence of fevers, an absence of tachycardia, and now we see um, uh, uh, an absence of a prominent leukocytosis. So it's also helping to take some of those morbid diagnoses from low to very low in the pretest probability space. I think where my mind is, is at right now is really being most curious about um, what the imaging ends up showing, because I think that will allow us to really um, set on and establish a problem space to do a much deeper analysis going forward.
Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I'm curious, what what would be your choice of of next imaging? Uh, maybe put yourself in the in the shoes of an inter an admitting internal medicine team, and no imaging has been obtained yet. Yeah, oh, I love this question so much because it's a dilemma. Um, that allows me to indulge both sides of my clinician identities as an emergency room physician and as an inpatient physician. Um, I think we face this question very often in the emergency room setting. Somebody has some uh, abnormal LFTs or maybe some right upper quadrant pain. And the question oftentimes comes up, should we get the right upper quadrant ultrasound or should we get the CT scan? Um, and I think I was initially taught that the right upper quadrant ultrasound should be the first choice. But with time, I think I have come to realize that the CT scan um, offers so many more advantages up, um, uh, up front, especially in this initial phase of uncertainty. A really helpful analogy that I heard from one of my colleagues, Dr. Ravi Jiha, is that um, the further away from the gallbladder the pathology may be, the more useful the CT scan becomes. So in other words, if we're just looking for cholecystitis and just want to answer the question of, is there cholecystitis, the right upper quadrant ultrasound can do extraordinary work in answering that question. But very often, that is one of the myriad of questions we're asking if we're worried about hepatobiliary disease. Other questions include, is there a pancreatic mass? Is there a stone in the common bile duct? Is there biliary ductal dilation? Is there potentially other gastrointestinal pathology that may be coming along for the ride with this jaundice? And each of those questions gets us further and further away from the sort of focal right upper quadrant and makes the CT scan more helpful. I will say also, just from a systems perspective, oftentimes CT scans can get done quicker than a right upper quadrant ultrasound can. And so from both an efficiency and a comprehensiveness of the data involved, I think I would probably reach for a CT scan here, being prepared for the fact that the results may be equivocal and we may reflex to a right upper quadrant ultrasound, or we may need to reflex to something like an MRCP with both of those being options. One gets us, I think, CRISPR imaging of the hepatobiliary system with the MRCP, and the right upper quadrant ultrasound can give us much more precise clarity of the gallbladder specifically. I, I, love, I love that teaching. I was actually just doing a, a little cognitive autopsy as to thinking of my cases. Have I ever gotten the right upper quadrant without the CT. And the only yes. that I can remember are actually patients that I ended up diagnosing as cholecystitis and sending to surgery. Um, right. Anyone right. else, it's always you end up getting both. And so I will show you what happened next is that a right upper quadrant was gotten and then a CT was gotten. So both were obtained. Um, the ultrasound right upper quadrant showed a distended gallbladder with cholelithiasis and sludge, um, but without any mural thickening. There was mild extra and intrahepatic biliary dilatation. They said there was a complex structure slash process involving the pancreatic head with peripancreatic edema, suggests acute subacute focal pancreatitis or neoplasm. Obviously, this was a very hedgy, unclear read, and so obviously the CT was um, obtained, and this was with contrast. Um, and it showed peripancreatic inflammation consistent with acute pancreatitis. There was no evidence of pancreatic necrosis or hemorrhage. There was mild biliary ductal dilatation. And again, on this scan, there was no mention of a specific mass. Um, so they actually did move forward with what you had said was an, you know, the next line to be a little more confident, which was an MRCP. So MRCP was done and said no hepatic lesions. The spleen was normal. There was mild acute pancreatitis, there was mild biliary dilatation with abrupt transition at the level of the pancreatic head. Um, and there was a distended gallbladder with sludge and mild wall thickening. And they said, you know, acute cholecystitis cannot be excluded. Um, they also got back some sort of like reflex labs that had been obtained right, right up front with those original labs. Um, and that was, you know, I think what we often will always send when we see any abnormalities in the liver. And that is, you know, hepatitis panel, which was pan negative. Um, some iron studies were obtained due to the mild anemia. Um, and they worked up for this uh, pancreatitis a little bit more with triglycerides and alcohol level, EBV, CMV, uh, all of which were normal or negative. All right. Excellent, Dr. Koch. Thank you so much for this updated information. Um, if we could go actually back to the um, CT and the right upper quadrant slide. Yeah. Um, and so I think 
if we start here, right, and sort of situate ourselves with the team admitting this patient, I think, again, we have now confirmed the presence of, because there is extra hepatic biliary dilatation, there is um, what seems to be extra hepatic biliary obstruction. So we can say that that is the cause of our jaundice. And now the door that we're stepping through is what are some causes of extra hepatic biliary obstruction. Um, those can include things like stones, strictures, and masses, particularly masses within the pancreatic head. And we don't see necessarily, while we see maybe some, um, some stones in the gallbladder, there's not a clear obstructing stone that's seen here. Um, we see that there is potentially an abrupt transition with uh, near or around the pancreatic head. The possibility of a stricture is still on the table here, but I think much more compelling is the fact that there is this kind of complex heterogeneous structure at the pancreatic head seen on ultrasound, not necessarily clearly seen on CT, and then potentially also um, uh, some sort of uh, complexity also seen again on the MRCP. And I think one, um, one of the things that I'm struck by in interpreting these results is the presence of peripancreatic inflammation and acute pancreatitis. Um, this is a lesson I, I learned uh, because I was um, caring for a patient where we delayed the diagnosis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma because of the presence of acute pancreatitis. And what I learned from the advanced endoscopist in that, um, in that specific case, she shared with me, she said, Jack, the presence of acute pancreatitis can make it very difficult to see both on CT scan and MRCP and even ERCP, the presence of a discrete pancreatic mass. Um, the, uh, the factors around the peripancreatic inflammation that exist in acute pancreatitis can disrupt the clarity of some of the imaging modalities that we see um, and make it difficult to discern ac um, acute active inflammation from evolving developing mass. And so the finding of acute pancreatitis in the presence of what seems to be um, at least some action at the pancreatic head um, really, I, I think, tempers my comfort in saying that there is no mass here, but rather saying there could be a mass and we may just not have the high def imaging yet to be able to clarify that. Um, and so then if we go and move forward to the MRCP slide, I think, again, we see this sort of confirmed findings of acute pancreatitis and then the abrupt transition at the level of the pancreatic head. And I think that abrupt transition um, uh, supports for me the possibility of one of two things. One thing is that there is actually a stricture in there that we can't see because of all the other inflammation that's happening. It's possible that there is a stuck stone in that region as well. Um, but I think more likely is the combination of some sort of inflammatory process at the pancreatic head, um, as well as potentially a stricture that has developed as a consequence of that, of, of that inflammatory process at the pancreatic head. I wanna be clear that when I say inflammatory process, I'm not necessarily saying an inflammatory disease like an autoimmune disease, but um, a, either um, a, a malignancy or an autoinflammatory disease that may cause mass effect. There is a long, long list of potential, um, of potential neoplasms that can, cause, um, that can cause pancreatic masses. The most common malignant one being pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and some of the benign ones being things like intraductal papillary neoplasms, mucinous cystic neoplasms. And then there's also a variety of autoinflammatory diseases that can cause mass-like lesions at the head of the pancreas. For example, IgG4 disease or even chronic autoimmune pancreatitis can have a mass-forming phenotype there. Um, I think all of those things are very difficult to make progress on from imaging alone. And oftentimes we need either direct visualization via endoscopy and very oftentimes tissue sampling, whether that's an actual um, uh, endoscopic ultrasound with biopsy or even, um, even brushings. And the ERCP will also allow us to potentially intervene on this biliary ductal obstruction and either place a stent that opens up, opens up a stricture and hopefully helps to relieve some of this jaundice. So I think both from a therapeutic stance and a diagnostic stance, um, communicating with our GI colleagues in the advanced endoscopist could be a helpful place to go next. And I think really trying to get clarity on the presence or absence of a mass and then the presence or absence of, of um, uh, a mass-like disease process, which could be one of those auto-inflammatory diseases. I think once we have that clarity, we'll be able to sort of outline with more detail um, uh, what the possible etiology could be. I, I love that. I think this is absolutely fantastic and you're, you're really on top of it. So I, I, I want to ask you though, what is it about this case that is making you not just say, oh, elevated lipase, a little bit of epigastric pain, the scans say pancreatitis, 
hey, this is pancreatitis and let's move on. What, what, what are the, the things that are not fitting the illness script for you and, and are really, and I, I think you've sort of been outlining them, but I think making it really clear yeah. for the learners, why are you not just pushing this into the usual pancreatitis sort of category? Oh, I appreciate that question so much, Dr. Cope. I think um, uh, uh, acute pancreatitis, uh, my sort of characteristic illness script for it um, is oftentimes um, relatively sudden onset, abrupt, um, and oftentimes relatively severe abdominal pain that really interferes with people's quality of life. Um, if I think about cases of pancreatitis that have come in the door, um, a very, very, very small proportion of them have been jaundiced. And I think that speaks to the tempo of presentation of pancreatitis relative to the tempo of presentation of this gentleman's disease process. Um, a bilirubin of 19 is not something that happens overnight. It's something that probably builds over days to weeks. And I think the finding of what brought him in the door is jaundice rather than abdominal pain. The amplitude of his bilirubin levels suggests a more subacute indolent process. Um, both of those factors, I think, make me question um, that uh, that acute pancreatitis is all that is going on. Now, I should say for a disease as common as pancreatitis, it's important for us as clinicians to have flexibility with our illness scripts. So it's not that this disease is complete or that this presentation is completely incompatible with acute pancreatitis, but I think the atypical nature um, uh, is a cue for me to say, what other diseases do I need to explore on the journey to settling on the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis as the cause here? And I think the combination of that tempo plus the imaging findings that suggest the possibility of a mass combined with that prior experience of, of, of having been taught by, um, by very experienced GI clinicians that acute pancreatitis can confound those findings. I think those all come together to make me say, Pancreatitis is not impossible, um, but there's other there's other morbid and more slowly progressive diseases that we need to exclude before we uh, before we settle there. If we ultimately do, outstanding. And I, I love um, you've really already said who I think you're gonna call. You've already told us you want to talk with your interventional GI colleagues. Um, so before I move on to their their the next aliquot, which includes their recommendations, I actually want to ask you: Is there any other sort of second pass workup that, you know, while, you know, maybe, you know, you know how the hospital is, things take time to happen, you know, procedures can take a while, maybe this was the weekend. Is there any second pass diagnostic workup that you're already sending, you're already putting in um, just, just for the sake of timing? Oh, it's a great question. I think, um, gosh, other things that we could look at, I guess um, the framework that I'm sort of falling back on here in terms of thinking what the second pass workup is, um, is actually a, a pancreatic mass evaluation, which I, w I should say we don't have clarity on that, but I think there's enough suggestion of it that I'm sort of collapsing that into the case presentation to answer this question of what, of what other workup would we send. And if we just think broadly about pancreatic masses in general, they could be um, malignant lesions, as we talked about. There could be neoplastic lesions. There's a variety of different um, inflammatory diseases. We said chronic pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, um, of which IgG4 can be a subclass. And then sometimes individuals who have had repeated bouts of pancreatitis can develop these walled off fluid collections like pseudocysts or walled off necrosis. If we think about what are the possible lab tests that could help us there, um, my brain reflexively goes to something like a CA199 level as a marker for pancreatic cancer. But I, um, uh, while I reflexively go there, I would actually try to push myself to hold off on that now. And the reason for that is that CA199 levels can be elevated in pancreatic cancer, but there's many other um, uh, diseases that lead to biliary obstruction that can lead to elevations of CA199. So where that becomes helpful is once we've established the diagnosis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, it can be helpful for monitoring, but I don't know that it would have a high discerning value at this point in the case where that diagnosis is still in question alongside other diagnoses. If it was exceedingly high, I'm sure that there is a level above which it can't be anything else but pancreatic cancer. I don't know what that level is. Um, so I don't know that I could use it in that way, but I imagine there may be other clinicians who have that knowledge who can use not just the presence or absence of an elevation, but the severity of elevation to guide their thinking. Um, other things that I would think about sending right now, maybe things like serum, serum IgG levels and an IgG index if we're entertaining the possibility of IgG4 disease. But I think the intention behind that would really be what you had mentioned, which is let's get those cooking 
as opposed to let's really see um, if these can clinch the diagnosis. Because I think while those are possible here, there um, uh, it still is uh, rendered less likely compared to the much more common causes of malignancy here. And then the last thing that I will say is that there are some infectious diseases that can do it, um, uh, but those are oftentimes things like mycobacterial or endemic fungal infections that can cause pancreatic masses. And we don't see clear exposures in this gentleman's history. So while I may ask him to make sure that those exposures aren't there, um, I wouldn't necessarily send any of those serologic studies yet. So maybe just the IgG levels, if anything, at this point, until we have the advanced imaging. Outstanding. So, you know, um... You know, a, a number of tests were sent off at this point, but also concurrently, of course, interventional GI was was consulted. They were the first people consulted. And I'll tell you what they said. You know, they said there's a mixed cholestatic hepatocellular LFT elevation, which is out of proportion to the mild biliary dilatation seen. Um, therefore, there's a lower suspicion for a biliary etiology of the LFT abnormalities. Favor acute hepatitis. He may have mild asymptomatic pancreatitis. So we said, oh, really? Okay, that's not exactly, you know, what I was thinking. Um, so got hepatology on board as well. And they said the exact opposite. Um, they said from a hepatology perspective, there does not seem to be compelling evidence of an intrinsic hepatitis causing liver test elevation. Um, consider possible obstruction due to stricture or malignancy or transient stone. So we really had very different recommendations from these two consultant groups. Um, so I'll tell you what sort of happened. You know, he didn't go immediately for a procedure as a result of this. Um, he remained in the hospital for multiple days at this point. He was totally asymptomatic other than his jaundice. He was eating well. LFTs remained pretty much the same um, with this, you know, wildly elevated bilirubin and, 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 and moderately elevated other LFTs. A lipase got repeated and it was 67 at this point. So basically normal now. Um, and a big workup um, recommended by hepatology just to make sure, even though they had a very low suspicion for an acute hepatitis causing any of this, as did I as the primary, you know, the primary on this. Um, but we did get that workup and it came back all negative, you know, your smooth muscle, your antimitochondrial, and then an autoimmune workup as well. Um, we did actually get tumor markers. Um, and the CA, CEA was essentially normal, maybe a tiny bit above. The CA199 was 507, the upper limit being 35. The CA125 was 7, so it was normal. So um, at this point, I think for the sake of timing, um, maybe I'll just ask you sort of your singular um, most important next steps that you would be taking pragmatically as a hospitalist. Um, what do you really want done for this patient? And, and to, to, to also put it in perspective, this patient is saying, doc, I, I don't feel comfortable leaving without a diagnosis. Um, yeah. I really don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I would say understandably from his perspective, right? Like what a disruptive and challenging uh, uh, set of symptoms to deal with, particularly in terms of the jaundice, the way that it changes how we really how we see ourselves day to day. Um, I think um, this could be a really rich opportunity to revisit with the advanced endoscopist whether the utility of an ERCP and endoscopic ultrasound with possible biopsy is now potentially more fruitful after the thorough evaluation for um, uh, an in, uh, in inflammatory liver disease has been completed. Outstanding. And so that's really what we did. You know, the one thing that we did do to kind of try and maybe push the story a little bit is we got a repeat MRCP. And I think if there's anything in medicine that I've learned as a hospitalist, sometimes repeating tests can be very helpful when they're interpretable tests, you know? Um, and in this case, the, the, the repeat MRCP um, really did highlight this ill-defined enhancement in the re re region of the ampulla. You know, they thought maybe it's just um, due to pancreatitis, but they really can't exclude a mass lesion. And they specifically recommended an ERCP. And so now I think we had enough ammo to really talk with the, the interventional um, endoscopists to say, hey, I really think we need to do an EUS with biopsy. And they said, yes, we agree. And so then, then this is sort of the essentially the final aliquot of information is that you know, we did do an ERCP and EUS with biopsy. Um, you can see here on the endoscopic ultrasound that there was very significant biliary dilatation. It's sort of this dark area um, right before the more cystic looking area. Um, that's dilated uh, bile duct. 
Um, and then over here uh, on the very right, you can see the, um, that the ampulla, you can see the sort of mass like lesion that's a little bit cystic looking there, sort of abnormal looking. And so I'll tell you the read. Um, the ERCP, they, they noted a tight two millimeter um, diameter stricture um, and they placed a stent. The EUS showed a discrete area of lobular pancreatic parenchyma at the, at the head and the body, and they got um, five fine needle biopsies. There also were some IPMNs and some gallbladder distension, but otherwise a pretty normal um, EGD EUS. The prelim path came back and it showed no malignant cells. And this is the final piece of information because after this, a diagnostic test uh, was revealed. All right, um, incredibly, incredibly interesting here. I think, um, you know, the utility of the repeat studies, I think really helps to clarify the problem that we're dealing with, with this mass at the ampullary head, um, or I should say the mass within the ampullary region and potentially within the pancreatic head. Um, I would say um, uh, uh, ampullary cancer comes into play here as certainly a, um, uh, uh, a possibility of sort of being one of the um, uh, pancreatic neoplasm adjacent di diseases arising uh, not necessarily from the pancreatic parenchyma, but also the ampulla. Um, and I think, I guess the question that I'm asking myself here is, does the lack of malignant cells on the, on the fine needle biopsy meaningfully decrease the probability of pancreatic adenocarcinoma beyond what the base rate of disease is? And I think if I'm being totally honest in answering that question, um, independent of this being a clinical unknown session, my answer to that is no. Um, I think that um, from from the handful of cases I've been exposed to in, in in this way, it can be exceedingly difficult to diagnose pancreatic adenocarcinoma in this setting of both acute pancreatitis and when there is a very, very small mass-like lesion here. And so the absence of finding malignant cells to me does not definitively equate to the absence of malignant cells in that in that area including the fact that we have IPMNs that we're seeing in the pancreas with those being um, of the cystic neoplasms, IPMNs and mucinous cystic neoplasms are ones that have increased malignant potential. And so there's a picture that is being painted here of somebody who could have underlying pancreatic, pancreatic adenocarcinoma and that just may not have progressed to the point where we can diagnose it. I think the story that I fall back on in, in being reminded of this principle is that there are some individuals where the diagnosis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma isn't confirmed until a, pa a surgical pathology from a Whipple procedure. And I think the fact that it sometimes gets to such an advanced procedure to definitively confirm the diagnosis highlights the challenge of making this case. Um, so I would say um, uh, all of those um, diseases that we talked about are still at play. Malignant neoplasms of the pancreas like pancreatic adenocarcinoma as well as other ones like neuro, neuroendocrine tumors and cholangiocarcinomas are also potential causes of malignant biliary obstruction. If I'm going at it from solely a base rate perspective, I think pancreatic, pancreatic adeno or an ampullary cancer um, is the epidemiologically most probable one. But I don't know that I feel like there's enough information to definitively say one over the other here from a malignant perspective. Um, I think below that is something like IgG4 disease. And then I know we touched on this very, very briefly, which was um, the iron studies came back. There was a high ferritin that was present. I initially sort of metabolized that as inflammation or as sort of um, anemia, or I should say as a chronic systemic inflammation leading to high ferritin levels. But if we go through, there's clearly no cancer after multiple biopsies. IgG4 disease has been taken off, the, off, uh, off of play deposition diseases could come into play with something like hemochromatosis. I think that's exceedingly unlikely relative to the far more probable malignant neoplasms that can cause biliary obstruction of which, you know, pancreatic carcinoma, ampullary cancer, and gallbladder cancer is like cholangiocarcinoma, I think are all more likely to be at play. So that's kind of where I would say, I don't know if it's necessarily putting my money down, but I may be putting my money into a corner of the table. Um, because I think uh, the whole, at least the lesson that I'm taking home is um, absence of, of malignancy on biopsy does not mean the absence of malignancy in the pancreas. I love that. And I love how you're, you're staying very real to, to real life because you're absolutely correct in real life that um, especially with a fine needle biopsy, right? This is not an excisional. This is not a core. It's a fine needle biopsy. We often miss things and the base rate of an adenocarcinoma and painless jaundice is very, very high or some sort of cancer. Um, but you also highlighted a differential. You didn't just focus on that. And you highlighted a differential, which includes, I think you brought it up quite a few different times, 
um, IgG4 disease. So I'll tell you that that test, um, she sent that off uh, quite early on um, and it did come back elevated. Um, the IgG4 subclass four um, was 211. And then the biopsy, um, and we had that in our back pocket sort of at about the time that the, um, like about a day after we got the, the biopsy and we're still waiting for results. So we had a tentative maybe diagnosis. Um, and then the actual path came back um, completely consistent with IgG4 related disease. And now um, I have a slide next on sort of what happened in this case, um, but I think I'm gonna actually skip and leave that for the end if people wanna stick around, because I really wanna have time for our expert to jump on and um, tell us a little bit about IgG4 disease, um, because that was the final diagnosis, IgG4 related disease with pancreatic or biliary manifestations. Incredible job. Um, and stick around so we can talk a little bit about, about the incredible job you did and any reflections you may have. But I want to hand it over to our um, incredible secret expert who's no longer secret, Dr. Heather Bukiri, um, who is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology uh, and the associate program director uh, for UCLA Rheumatology Fellowship and an educator for excellence, uh, not just for the medical students, but for all of us, truly. Um, so take it away, Heather. Um, you just tell me next slide and I'll advance. Okay. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, great job with this case. And um, I will te texted me when he had diagnosed this. And I just love that he thinks like a specialist. You're basically an honorary rheumatologist at this point. Um, so what is IgG4 related disease? So I, I think that we kind of think of this as like one of the newer great mimickers, almost like sarcoidosis. Um, where you could kind of put it in your differential with a, a lot of different things because it is a systemic condition and because it can affect a variety of different organs. Um, the the ba Basically, when we're seeing patients, um, we kind of think of this as an indolent, slowly progressive type of process. This picture here shows the key sites of IgG4-related inflammation. And again, it's something that we think of as being um, an infiltrative inflammatory disorder. And so it has a tendency to create these mass-like structures or tumor-like structures in the affected organs. Um, the, the most common kind of areas that we see it in clinically would be the parotids and then also in the pancreas. But as this picture shows, you can get it um, throughout the body. Next slide. So what is IgG4? So um, um, IgG4 is a subtype of IgG. Um, it's sparse and actually it's kind of thought to be a bystander in the pathogenesis of IgG4 related disease, um, which isn't fully elucidated. Um, and so the IgG4 itself is not thought to be the thing that's creating inflammation or damage Rather, that's through a T cell mediated response. Um, and the IgG4 is kind of produced as a bystander. And by proxy of that, will go up in the serum with continued inflammation. Next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned, IgG4 related disease is a pretty indolent condition. Um, and really, uh, symptoms progress gradually. The pathognomonic term that they give us for rheumatology boards is a sausage pancreas. Um, and so the CT scan here, you can see kind of this diffusely fluffy pancreas that looks a lot bigger than it should be. Um, and you see kind of changes like this in affected organs. Um, next slide. The epidemiology of IgG4 related disease, similar to the pathogenesis, is not well understood. On the spectrum of things, this is a relatively new medical diagnosis. It was really about 20 years ago in 2003 when IgG4 related disease was actually recognized as this like a systemic condition. Um, and we know that it has a tendency to affect men more commonly than women. Um, and it's usually a disease of um, middle to of the middle age to elderly, um, not something that we see commonly in young adults or pediatric patients. So when should you think about IgG4 related disease? So as this case emphasized, definitely when you have 
any sort of pancreatic pathology going on, especially in the context of something that looks like a pancreatic tumor or if you have diffuse enlargement of the pancreas. Um, but really when you have other kind of nonspecific symptoms like diffuse lymphadenopathy, glandular enlargement, as I mentioned, IgG4 related disease really likes the parotid glands. Um, and so it's one of the things that I'll send off when I have a patient who's coming in with parotid tender, tenderness and sicka symptoms. Um, also can cause pseudotumors throughout the body. So you can get proptosis and orbital pseudotumor, um, retroperitoneal fibrosis. And kind of an interesting one is aortitis and periaortitis. IgG4, I think more commonly causes a periaortitis where you get kind of the circumferential inflammation around the vessel. Um, and you can also get that around the ureters. Um, so next slide. Uh, prior to the ACR, the American College of Rheumatology coming out with guidelines for IgG4 related disease, um, it was considered a histopathological diagnosis. Uh, characterized by a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, story form fibrosis. And so it's almost like a magic eye to kind of squint at it and see like a whirling pattern here. Um, but to a pathologist, it's probably better appreciated. And then on immunohistochemical staining, you'll see increased IgG4 plasma cells. So um, if you suspect IgG4-related disease, it's important to just let the pathologist know that because sometimes they won't do the immunohistochemical staining. Um, and so definitely make sure you communicate and let them know if that's what you're looking for. And then, um, so in Will's case, we had an elevated IgG4 in the plasma, which is what we typically will see. Um, a normal IgG4 level doesn't rule out IgG4-related disease, and that's why biopsy is always important if your clinical suspicion is very high. Um, you can also check complements. In some situations, a C3 and C4 are low, and usually that's when there's renal involvement with the IgG4. Um, you may also see a mild eosinophilia um, in IgG4. And then just kind of touching on some of those other manifestations that we see more commonly. So in women, um, IgG4 more commonly affects the head and neck area. And so you can see here that um, this patient has glandular enlargement. Um, other things that you would want to consider in this circumstance would be sarcoidosis, Sjogren's, and then of course, malignancy. Here again is uh, a picture of the sausage pancreas. Um, and again, IgG4, you can really appreciate it, how it's presenting like a mass-like infiltration of the tissue. Sclerosing cholangitis is another um, complication of IgG4-related disease, and it actually can occur in conjunction with the pancreatic disease. Um, and also in isolation. So something to consider on your differential diagnosis when you're having pathology involving the biliary tree. And then retroperitoneal fibrosis. Um, so you can see here a lot of inflammation um, surrounding the kidney, which sits in the retroperitoneum. Um, patients will typically present with back pain in this circumstance. Um, and they tend to have a pretty good response to steroid treatment. Next slide. Um, oh, if you go back one. So the, here's a picture kind of demonstrating that periaortitis. And so again, um, seeing that circumferential thickening around the vessel. All right, next slide. Pulmonary disease, so um, kind of nonspecific, um, but it can mimic sarcoidosis. And so um, in most instances, when we suspect IgG4-related disease in the lungs, we typically will see evidence of it in other places too. But again, another instance where biopsy is very important. 
So treatment of IgG4 related disease. Um, so uh, prednisone is first line treatment. A lot of patients do well with just uh, like six month course of prednisone. In patients who have more severe multi-system disease, we typically will use a steroid sparing agent um, with the more severe disease being defined by more organ involvement and higher serum levels of IgG4. And rituximab is our go-to. Next slide. Prognosis. So IgG4-related disease tends to be a chronic relapsing condition. Um, and so patients may have periods of remission and then have new infiltration. Um, the disease itself doesn't always infiltrate in the same place, so they may represent with infiltration in different tissue. Um, and then always important to keep in mind that uh, malignancy can coexist with IgG4-related disease. And so it's always important if you have a high clinical suspicion to rule out malignancy. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bakari. That was that Thank was a you. recap of, of IgG4 and um, really very pertinent in this case um, because this patient really ended up having both pancreatic and also uh, that the sclerosing cholangitis type picture as well. Yes. Um, sorry, that's my dog. So I think we're, we're about four minutes over time. So I think if anyone needs to, to leave, I think absolutely, um, pl please do so. I just wanted to leave a couple minutes um, for Dr. Penner, if you did have any specific reflections, and I'll just put up the case resolution as well. So we all know what happened to this patient at the end, um, in case anyone has any further questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cope. Um, my main reflection is one of gratitude, I think, both for the opportunity to get to come and speak with everyone today, the opportunity to analyze a case that was so thoughtfully put together, um, and to get to learn from you, Dr. Bukiri, in terms of the some of the further nuances, not just of the pancreatic and hepatobiliary manifestations, but also the systemic manifestations of IgG4 disease. Um, uh, this was just uh, an overwhelmingly wonderful experience. Um, and I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. So just want to say thank you so much. Again, the, the work that goes into this is not lost on me. Um, uh, I get to be the one who, who uh, benefits by practicing the case, uh, the case analysis process. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful for the opportunity to get to do this with everyone today. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much. And it was just an unbelievable performance and, and really just loved all the teaching along the way and um, also loved your final final thoughts uh, about the final diagnostic tests and the reality of real world yields of, of biopsies. Um, just so in case anyone wanted to know, this patient did very well. Um, they got placed on a course of steroids um, and had resolution of, of most of their symptoms. As Dr. Bakuri mentioned though, often these patients can have relapse and this patient did relapse and um, eventually was needed to be started on a second agent. They tried to do rituximab. Unfortunately, there were insurance issues. And so the patient is on azithroprine um, as a steroid sparing agent and doing very, very well. Um, so thank you everyone so much. Sorry we went a few minutes uh, over, but I'm just really excited to have been able to present this case and hope everyone has a great rest of your day. All right, Thank you so much, panel. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for Grand Rounds. And everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jack. That was incredible.